At the time of the Spanish Armada, the Spanish Empire under King Philip II was vast. Like the British Empire centuries later, the sun literally never set on King Philip's dominions. Philip ruled over lands as far apart as Spain, Portugal, the Azores, parts of Italy, the Spanish Netherlands, South America and the Far East. The men, wealth, skills and arms from these lands all helped make Spain the most formidable of opponents. Despite the Armada being made up of many nationalities, noblemen, mercenaries and professional soldiers, the commander, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, maintained a rigid discipline throughout the campaign. In fact, despite the setbacks, running battles and eventual disasters, discipline was surprisingly well maintained. Despite the hammering and battering the Spanish received at the hands of English gunnery, the English had not defeated the Armada, merely temporarily deflected it. On top of this, there was to be no swearing. The mass was heard on every ship several times a day. Medina Sidonia, though no naval commander, even hung one of his captains for disobeying orders. With the running battles up the channel, the English were rapidly running out of powder and shot. It would be easy to think that a country with a great naval tradition like England, fighting close to our own shores, would have a constant ready supply of ammunition. But no. Despite constant pleading, the Queen and her council sent very little to her battling ships. Legend claims that at one point, the English were forced to fire ploughshares at the Spanish as they had run out of cannonballs. William Thomas, an English master gunner stationed at Flushing, wrote about this. On the 30th of September, he wrote to Lord Burley, they were fain at last to use plough chains instead of bullets. Had full replenishment of powder and shot been possible at this point, it might indeed have been speculated the woefulest time for Spain. The English and Spanish fought each other as the crescent formation ground its way up the channel. One of the most important battles was fought around Portland Bill. Martin Frobisher in the Triumph was isolated with his squadron near Portland Bill, possibly to lure the Spanish towards the Portland race. The Portland race was a dangerous piece of water with powerful tides and eddies, fatal to the inexperienced navigator. The galleasses engaged Frobisher's squadron, which would stood the attack, and the two fleets then re-engaged to the south. They exchanged cannon fire until the evening. The English attack concentrated on Recaude San Juan and Medina Sidonia San Martin, whose 80 cannibals fired were answered by more than 500 English ones. This small skirmish, which may have seemed insignificant at the time, has now been suggested to be the reason that the Spanish missed the tide to get into the Solent by the Isle of Wight to anchor. An official report on the fight around Portland Bill. The wind then shifted to the southeastwards and so to south-southwest. At what time, a troop of Her Majesty's ships and sundry merchants assailed the Spanish fleet so sharply that they were all forced to give way and bear room. The witch's lordship perceiving, together with the distress that the Triumph and the five merchant ships in her company were in, called unto certain of Her Majesty's ships then near at hand and charged them straightly to follow him, and to set freshly upon the Spaniards and to go within musket shot of the enemy. Before they could discharge any one piece of the ordnance, thereby to succour the triumph, which was very well performed by the Ark, the Elizabeth Jonas, the Galleon of Leicester, the Golden Lion, the Victory, the Mary Rose, the Dreadnought and the Swallow, for so they went in order to the fight. Which the Duke of Medina perceiving, came out with 16 of his best galleons to impeach his lordship and stop him from assisting the triumph. At which assault, after wonderful sharp conflict, the Spanish were forced to give way and to flock together like sheep. In this conflict, one William Cox, captain of a small pinnace of Sir William Winters, named the Delight, showed himself more valiant in the face of his enemies at the hottest of the encounter, where after was lost in life in the service with a great shot. Towards the evening, some four or five ships of the Spanish fleet edged out to the southwestwards, where some of our ships met them amongst which the Mayflower of London discharged some pieces at them very valiantly, which ship and company at sundry other times behaved very stoutly. 
The fight was very nobly continued from morning until evening, the Lord Admiral being always in the hottest of the encounter, and it may well be said that for the time there was never seen a more terrible value of great shot, nor more hot fight than this was, for although the musketeers and harquebusiers were then infinite, yet could they not be discerned nor heard, for that great ordnance came so thick that a man would have judged it to have been a hot skirmish of small shot, being all the fight long within half musket shot of the enemy. This great fight being ended, the next day, being Wednesday the 24th of July, there was little done. For that in the fight on Sunday and Tuesday, much of our munition had been spent, and therefore the Lord Admiral sent divers barks and pinnaces upon the shore for a new supply of such provisions. The commander of the Spanish fleet, Medina Sidonia, has often been blamed for not communicating with the Duke of Parma, who he was to link up with. Apparently, he did not keep him updated with his location and what his intentions were. But this is not true. He tried. He tried on several occasions. As did his landward counterpart, the Duke of Parma. The Duke of Parma sent several pinnaces to contact Sidonia. One ran into the Dutch and had to retreat whilst another ran aground on a sandbar. Medina Sidonia likewise tried, but again, a messenger could only go the speed the wind and tides allowed, and had to dodge not only the English ships, but the Dutch, who were at sea as well. After the engagement around Portland Bill, and the following firefight around the Isle of Wight, the English had nearly enough exhausted their powder and shot from their lockers, and were forced to retire. A report at the time described the desperate battles around the Isle of Wight. With little wind, the principal English ships were towed towards the galleasses, but as the wind got up, the Spanish were able to relieve the beleaguered galleasses. The tables were then turned on the Triumph, which was disabled, but shielded by the rest of the English fleet from the approaching Spanish, who hoped to board them. A freshening wind enabled the English to regain the weather gauge, and there was a very sharp fight for the time before the Spanish in the words of Medina Sidonia, saw the advantage was no longer with us. As the English were running low on ammunition, it was thought prudent not to engage the Spanish fleet again until Dover, where reinforcements and further supplies could be had. Now for as much as our powder and shot was well wasted, the Lord Admiral thought it was not good in policy to assail them any more until their coming near unto Dover, where he should find the army which he had left under the conduction of the Lord Henry Seymour and Sir William Winter, knight, ready to join with his lordship, whereby our fleet should be much strengthened, and in the meantime better store of munition might be provided from the store. All this day and Saturday, being the 27th of July, the Spanish went always before the English army like sheep. The English objective was to deny the Spanish entry to the Solent, either from the westward or the eastward. The non pareil and the Mary Rose, referred to by Howard, were in Drake's squadron, the testimony of a Seville captain to the seaward of the Spanish fleet stated that the enemy charged upon the said wing in such ways that he who were there were cornered so that if the Duke had not gone about with his flagship we should have come out vanquished that day. It is thus suggested that the northerly squadrons of the English fleet were unable to impede Spanish access to the Solent from the eastward but that the southerly squadron under Drake was working into the seaward flank of the Armada in order to break it and force it to leeward, i.e. to a north-easterly course, and thus pass the entrance to the Solent from the east, onto the Owa's sandbanks of Selsey Bill. Thus the Armada were unable to obtain any objective that it may have had of gaining the Solent, or to mount an invasion, and were forced to continue up the channel. It is considered unlikely that the Spanish ever planned to enter the Solent from the west, since they would have had to run the gauntlet both of the needles and the battery of Hearst Castle. However, the approach from St Helens Roads would only have been possible between 7am and noon on that day, otherwise the tide and current would have been against such an approach. It is suggested that the stragglers Santa Anna and San Luis de Portugal were a similar trap to the one set by Martin Frobisher in the triumph a couple of days previously. Recaude, the Spanish second in command, is quoted after the triumph slipped from his grasp. In my opinion, we should have not have desisted as our flagship did, until we had either made them run aground or else followed them into a port. Nor was it wise to sail beyond that anchorage near to the Isle of Wight.
There were no Spanish ships sunk in the channel, despite the drawn out battles that took place from the Lizard to well past the Isle of Wight. Some have been captured, like the Rosario. Check out our video here for that story. In fact, the first ships sunk were during the Battle of Graveling after the fireship attack off Calais. When the Spanish anchored near Calais at Graveline, Medina Sidonia knew the dangers only too well. It was not a safe anchorage and was open to attack and the weather. But he could not progress any further until he knew where the Duke of Parma was and when his invasion army would be ready. He had written to King Philip II that stated, If I haven't heard from Parma, I must anchor off the Isle of Wight, as there is no safe anchorage past there. When anchored at Graveline, Medina Sidonia was aware the English may attack with fire ships. They were not a surprise as is sometimes suggested. Medina Sidonia had ordered patrol boats to be out during the night, and in fact, during the attack, several fire ships were towed away, and no actual Spanish ships were destroyed by the fire ships. To see a video on the fire ships and the hell burners which inspired them, click here or follow the link in the description box below. If you have missed our first three parts of our amazing facts on the Spanish Armada, there are links to all three in the description box below. If you're enjoying our content, it'd be really appreciated for a like, a share and a subscribe. As always, thanks for watching.